Thank you for the introduction and I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation and the very generous hospitality. Um, so let me start with, um, I need to start with some notation. Work over a number field. We we'll denote by A its ring of Adels. Um, G will be a fixed connector reductive algebraic group over F. Um, a of G will be the space of automorphic forms. On G of Adels, these are functions on this automorphic quotient brackets G that are smooth, of moderate growth, right? K invariant, so K is the maximal compact of GA and uh, finite, Z finite Z is the center of universal enveloping algebra of the algebra of, of G. So the standard definition of automorphic forms. And then we take a closed subgroup and the period, an automorphic period will be just this integral. So it's an integral of an automorphic form uh, over, over the orthomorphic quotient G prime A mod G prime F. Um, okay. So here's the definition again. Um, and some comments. So first of all, it really only makes sense to integrate over, um, you have to also mod out by intersection of a center of G with G prime. Second comment is that let, let, if I denote by A0 of G the cusp forms, then you should really assume that the quotient G mod G prime is quasi-affine. In that case, the period will be well defined at least on the space of the cusp forms. Um, well, a trivial comment is if this quotient is compact, then the period is well defined on the whole space of automorphic forms. But in total generality, it will only be defined for cusp forms. Um, and so, the goal is of, of my talk here is to address the question how to define a period integral for a general automorphic form, or almost all automorphic forms. So, what would we expect of such a construction? Well, it should be equivariant, so it should verify whatever this linear form, whatever the equivariance of this linear form is. Um, you would hope that your construction coincides with the integral whenever it actually converges. Um, I would also address, I'd like to address the question, when, when does it really converge? What, what are the conditions? And I'd like to frame them in terms of exponents of, of automorphic forms. Okay. Um, so, let me be more precise about the strategy I want to employ. So, I want to define a truncation operator, mixed, called mixed truncation operator, that takes an automorphic form and spits out a rapidly decreasing function on this automorphic quotient G prime A and G prime F. And T here is a certain will be a, for any t, there's a, a parameter of truncation that lives in some fixed Euclidean space. And what would we expect uh, this truncation operator to give us? Well, since it gives uh, rapidly decreasing functions, the integral will now converge. But more importantly, we would expect the behavior in this truncation parameter to be very nice. In particular, when you, as you vary the truncation operate, uh, parameter, this integral should be equal to some very explicit polynomial exponential function, where these polynomials depend on, on the anthropomorphic form, the uh, phi, 
and well, they're almost all zero. And the crucial part will be that we would expect the, the polynomial that corresponds to the exponent zero to be actually constant for almost all uh, automorphic forms except some specified ones. So in this case, we can define a, a subspace of automorphic forms, which are those for which the, the polynomial part of this exponential polynomial function is constant. And we would like to um, say that our extension of this linear form of the period integral would be this particular constant term. Um, and so this, this should be the desired extension, this should be the equivariant well-behaved and canonical uh, extension of the integral period. So, um, so let me mention the inspiration of the, for, for this kind of approach. Um, so first of all, there's Arthur Langlands' circation operator that was used in the case where g is g prime times g prime in the study of the scalar product. Um, so this is the original truncation operator. Um, but it wasn't really the, um, the problem of extension of a scalar product to, wasn't really addressed in this setting. This, this point of view was really first, I think, employed by Zagier and Kasselman for the case of GL2. And then in this generality that I talked about, it was really fully developed by Jacques Lapidrungowski for the case of Galois periods where G is restriction of scalars of G prime from E to F for quadratic extensions. Um, I also want to mention the work of Ichino Yamana on uh, regularized ranking zerberg integrals. So in all these cases, they, they introduce uh, a truncation operator and they study the resulting invariant periods. And of course, they do uh, much more than that. My goal would be just to um, do it the, the first step in the study of generalized reductive periods. Okay, so uh, let me give a, an example of, uh, of a Mellon transform. So Mellon transform can be seen as a period over on GL2 over a subgroup, which is GL1. Uh, so for a cuspidal automorphic representation of GL2, we can consider the following integral when we integrate over GL1 inside of GL2, embedded naturally, diagonally. And so such an integral, we know that it, in a certain specified sense, represents the standard L function at s plus one half. And it converges absolutely if, if we take a cast point. So how can we, but if you take an Eisenstein series, you cannot take its Mellon transform. So the way it's done in this case, well, the truncation works, you have to um, subtract some constant terms as you approach cusps. So you, you will have to subtract two constant terms, the one for the standard Borel and, and another one for, non for the opposite Borel. And or t is just a number. And so, yeah, so by that I mean we only take this term if h is bigger than e to the t, and this term only when it's small. Um, now, it's a fact that once you do that, you can integrate. Um, and moreover, it will usually have a well-defined constant term. And and it will behave like you, you would expect it to behave in an equivariant way, but it's really, you get more than that, it still represents 
the the L function. So if if phi is an Eisenstein series induced from two characters of GL1, you actually end up getting essentially the same term. Um, so the standard L function of chi1 and chi2 divided by chi1, chi2, which is like an adjoint term. Okay, so we like to generalize this. Uh, but this example really shows that it, th there should be, or, or often there is a way of really extending it, not just abstractly, but, but preserving all the nice properties that the period has for cost forms. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about a little, uh, maybe one slide, but the methods that actually go into this, um, So it's pretty abstract, actually, and it, it's nice. So, um, so the abstract setup is V is a finite dimensional Euclidean rect space over R, and a cone is just a finite inter intersection of host spaces. So face, faces of a cone are its intersection with hyperplanes. So it has a finite number of faces, F of C is the set of faces. Um, so VC is the linear span of C, so it doesn't have to be an, it can have an empty and interior, so VC would be the linear space of the cone. And then we can talk about relative interior of C, which is the, the largest open set of VC that is contained in the cone C. Um, we can also define its dual cone, so all the elements that are positive on the cone. Uh, and for each face, we can also define another cone, which is called angle cone or tangent cone, and is defined as, as the set of half lines that start at an interior point of the face and go in the direction of the cone. Uh, so, I guess the standard example would be a cone like this in R2. It has four faces, zero, F1, F2, and the, the whole cone is its own face. And then, if you take the zero face, the, the tangent cone is the cone itself. If you take the cone itself, well, you get the full space. And then for these two proper faces, well, this just will be the full half line. And for the other one is the other half line. So it's a pretty standard construction in this theory. Uh, Um, okay, but the, the way I m mentioned this is that in the theory of reductive groups, we have a very particular cone that often pops up is the positive chamber associated to a minimal parabolic subgroup. And then its faces will be in bijection with standard parabolic subgroups. So this is the kind of setup I will want to apply this general theory of cones. So if I denote bracket A, the characteristic function of any subset of the vector space. So it turns out, so for people who are familiar with constructions of Arthur and the work of Langlands, uh, Einstein series, uh, there's a famous result that's called Langlands combinatorial lemma in the context of, of chambers for reductive groups. Well, it turns out this, this, this result is actually completely general. Uh, we get such an identity, such an alternating sum of characteristic functions of interiors of cones or and its duals. So it's a very useful combinatorial tool in, uh, when doing uh, truncation operators. And it's only been proved by 
Schneider two years ago, and well, this is something that led me to believe that you can actually work out something much more general than, than the, the particular cases of truncation that are known. Um, so this was really, uh, this is why I want to bring this up. Okay, so now I want to give you the construction. So we'll fix a uh, maximal F split torus of G. Then we get a natural vector or Euclidean actually vector space A0, which is um, you tensor the group of co-characters of your split torus. You fix also B a minimal parabolic and mentioned you get the positive chamber. So elements that are positive when evaluated at simple root. And so we, it can be seen in this framework of cones. It's a cone in this vector space. And the faces are in bijection with standard parabolic subgroups. And so this bijection, I will denote it. So P corresponds to a cone AP plus, which is a face of, of this cone AB plus. Okay, um, so this is the standard theory. Now, let's introduce the subgroup. So, now I've, I have to assume G prime is connected and reductive. So we can fix a maximal split torus of G prime that I'm gonna denote with a prime. So it's A zero prime. Uh, there's a typo, so it should be A zero. So then, we can, if you fix it, to be contained in the split torus of G, then this vector space A0 prime, defined analogously, will be contained in A0. So this should be A0. So it's a subspace of this bigger space. And then I will fix uh, a minimal parabolic of G prime. I'm not fixing a parabolic of G. I'm just fixing actually only this one. So it's a minimal parabolic containing this fixed split torus. So what, what really goes into this question is how, do, how does Ziegel domain of G prime sits inside of a Ziegel domain of G? And, and this can be really reduced to studying the, the geometry of corresponding chambers. So if you start out with this small chamber on the, on the smaller group G prime, AB plus, well, essentially, well, trivially, it decomposes as a disjoint union of its intersections with interiors of AP plus, of all these faces. That's, this is just because the full space A0 is a disjoint union of AP pluses. So P's run over all... S One is contained in the other. That you can always assume that. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm not fixing A0. I'm, I'm fixing A0 prime. I'm taking a centralizer and then I'm taking... Yeah. Yeah, so the way to go is to start with G prime, fix everything there. Um, in any case, the... the the full construction should be, and is, independent of all these choices. So this cone AB plus decomposes as follows. You can just take all the possible intersections with interiors of this, in this way it will be disjoint, of interiors of all these chambers associated to all possible semi-standard parabolics. And so I define this set F G P zero prime. There are these are well, semi-standard parabolics of G, for which this intersection is actually non-empty. So this just means semi-standard parabolics of G, and I want this intersection to be non-empty. And so when it's non-empty, I will consider this cone which is take the standard cone associated to P and intersect it with this subspace. And so, well, this is really where, where 
the former slides come into the picture, if you intersect, so these cones are actually very simple geometrically, they're simplicial cones. However, if you intersect a nice cone with a with an arbitrary subspace, you can get something essentially arbitrarily complicated. So these will really be the cones to which I want to apply general theory of that I sort of hint at in the former slide. Um, another property is that if your parabolic verifies this condition, the intersection will actually be a parabolic subgroup of G prime, of P0 prime should be B prime. It will be a standard parabolic of G prime. So this condition already implies that intersection is actually a parabolic of your smaller group. Okay. So, what, well, in a sense of geometry, can have a, a lot of faces. Like in three dimensions, in three dimensions, the cones are just, have three faces, the, these cones. But, arbitrary shaped is what I mean. Yeah. Arbitrary, essentially arbitrary polyhedral cone. Essentially. I just mean that the geometry can be complicated. That's what I mean by this. It is actually contained in its dual, but that's basically all you can say. All right. Um, so all this notation gives you the truncation operator. So you take an automorphic form, and the truncation operator is as follows. So it's usually in this setting that we take some alternating sums. So the indexing set is this set of these parabolic subgroups that I've just defined. Then you sum over the rational points are over your G, group G prime. So I think next slide will explain. So P prime is intersection of P with G prime. It's a parabolic subgroup of G prime. Then you take the constant term of phi with respect to this parabolic P. And the truncation condition is that, um, so there's a standard way to linearize your group during using the harsh chandra function. The truncation condition is that you are in the interior of a dual of these, of these, inter, of these cones that are defined as intersections with the subspace. So that's the definition. And T is a parameter. It, it lives in this smaller space of associated to group G prime. And so um, we get what we want by this using this operator. So it's the function becomes rapidly decreasing on this subgroup, for at least for regular positive parameters. And then as you study the integral, the ensuing integral that you know now that converges, it actually is a polynomial exponential. Explicit polynomial exponential. And we define the extension that was sometimes denoted as a start integral as the constant term of this polynomial exponential. So as I said, there's a, um, this definition will make sense on some specific, on explicitly defined subspace, AG star, where you have to assume that exponents of phi avoid certain hyperplanes. I'm not going to make this condition explicit here, but there's a very explicit condition. And then you check that this is actually invariant and independent of all the choices. So we get a, a canonical is maybe too much of a word, but but definitely invariant of everything we did and um, every of all the choices that we made, and it's uh, it's invariant 
with respect to the action of G prime. And we also get, as a byproduct of this construction, explicit conditions for convergence. So for example, it's a natural question to ask, when does it converge on the residual spectrum and so on, so this could be addressed. Okay. Um, let me just mention some variants. Um, so this is what we've defined now. You can add a character, and as it happened in the case of Manning transform, sometimes there's no essential way to, to change this period, but if there's a possibility to add something like a determinant, so in the case where the center of G prime is not the center of G intersected with G prime, then adding this character will actually allow you to define this as a meromorphic function of psi. So when you're in this situation, you can actually always regularize this period for generic psi. Uh, and you can also actually, the, con the condition for G to be connected is not necessary. Uh, just as a comparison, so strictly speaking, we get Arthur's truncation if G prime is G. So if, not for the L2, but for the L1 product. And then this, this indexing set is just standard parabolics of G. If, if it's a scalar product, then we actually get something like a diagonal Arthur's operator that I think essentially does the same job, but, so the, the FG, the indexing set, will be the parabolics of your group that are of type P times P. Um, so more generally, um, if G prime is a fixed point of involution, then you should only use the theta stable parabolics that contain a, right, that contain some fixed minimal parabolic of your G theta. This is a fixed minimal. The theta stable and intersection is just, contains a standard minimal parabolic. And this coincides with Jacques Lapid's Zhugowski construction. Uh, okay, and it essentially also coincides with Ichina Yamana's regularization. But it should be mentioned this is really a, um, all these three cases are actually symmetric, this one is not. <clears throat> I think so. But you, you should, for now, you, to prove it, you would have to, you mean the Ichino Yamanas case? I mean, every, in these cases, the truncation is, is, is the same. In this case, the truncation is not the same, but, constant, the, 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 gen, the regular period, the truncation is a, is, a, is a tool, but this constant term, I, I, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be the same thing. There's no way to say it, um, yeah, just because it's invariant, there's no other way, but you have to check it. Okay, um, so I wanted to show a special case of how it looks like as, as a means of application of this result. So let's take a maximal parabolic subgroup that is self-associate of this bigger group G and a cuspidal representation of the levy, MP. And we would like to regularize, look at what the regularization of the Eisenstein series looks. So um, we can form this Einstein series that I wanna normalize like in the work of Langland Shahidi. So, so the complex parameter can be written as S pi, so pi is a fixed fun is a, the fundamental weight. And then the Eisenstein series is actually a function of a complex variable. Um, and so, so um, I wanna show you just uh, how to, how to, 
formula looks in this setting. So the, the regularized period is the, the truncated one minus some ex very explicit periods over Levy subgroups of G prime. And these terms, these are some explicit exponentials, but what's sort of interesting is the is these denominators, which are singularities of these periods, and as we'll see later, they're 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 connected to some interesting questions. So um so this W is just um standard subgroup of subset of Val group. The sign is either plus or minus. MW is the intertwining operator. And now, so this denominator is what's really interesting here. And so what is this constant? So, well, C is the, if you take the half sum of roots are associated to P, it's just a sum multiple of the fundamental weight. So it's something that can be computed for any group G. And then here we get one minus two and Q, and then Q is, is the quotient of dimension of, so Q prime here is the intersection of, right, let me say it a bit slower. So first of all, the sum is over parabolic subgroups that are conjugate to P, because these are the only constant terms that make sense for this Eisenstein series. And so these are parabolic subgroups that conjugate to P and appear in this indexing set of the regularization. And for any such uh, parabolic subgroup, this is essentially a constant term of this Eisenstein series with respect to Q. So this is what appears here. Then for such a group Q, uh, Q prime is just the intersection with G prime. So you get periods on smaller groups, which is MQ prime, the Levy subgroup of this parabolic subgroup Q prime of G prime. And it's a very explicit singularity in terms of parameter s. And so this nq would be the dimension of a unipotent radical of q prime divided by dimension of unipotent radical of q. So it's a number. Uh, it's, it's rational. It's not natural. But anyway, it's here. And then c is something that can be explicitly computed for any group g. And so you, you see that singularities of this regularized period can be analyzed in this way. So there are, well, all the singularities, of course, of Einstein series, but also these numbers, very concrete numbers. Um, and so to continue this example to something more concrete, this is part of joint work uh, with ongoing joint work with Aaron Pollock and Chen Wan. So we can take group G to be SO 2N plus 3, split group, and a subgroup to be SO N plus 3 times SO N. And P is a parabolic subgroup with Levy GL1 SO 2N plus 1. And I'm going to take a hospital generic automorphic representation of SO 2N plus 1 and a trivial character on GL1. So what does this formula look like? So we look at this Einstein series, the regularized Einstein series period. So there's always this truncation part. Then the next term, you actually see the period of, of the cusp form. So I'm ignoring this compact K that was before. The period of the cusp form over SO n plus 1 SO n, which is a subgroup of SO 2 n plus 1. And the singularity here appears at one half. <clears throat> then there's a symmetric sort of term corresponding to a defining operator where the sign appears here. And there's, there's other periods, one more period that appears, but it's essentially a period of this cusp form over SON plus 3, SON minus 2. And so here's a result of the theorem of the Pendrel Prasad that for of a local non-comedian fields, if you take a quasi-split group and an involution. So if G has a generic uh, distinguished representation, then there exists a theta split Borel. 
So all these cases, G prime is a, is a fixed point of an involution. So G prime is a fixed point of involution on G. S1 plus 1 times S1 is a fixed point of involution on S2 plus 1, and so is S1 plus 3, S1 minus 2. However, um, this case is, does not satisfy this condition that there exists a split Borel, and this one doesn't either. So if you start with generic representations, this will be generic. So is this. So there are no, there cannot be any generic distinguished representations, so the periods must vanish. So this one vanishes by the process, this also vanishes by the fact that it's equivariant. And so this thing actually simplifies something much simpler. Uh, we get that this truncation, of course, truncation is not equivariant, that it stays, equals, well, the period over, so this one, this is the only one that sat, does satisfy the condition of Prasad. So we get the period of the cusp form and the symmetric period of its cusp form applied to interrunning operator. And so what we can do now is take a residue at one half. If you take a residue at one half and a constant term with respect to this truncation variable t, we want to get rid of it. You get that the period of a residue of Einstein series of one half equals, so now the, the, the correct formula would be the period of this section of SON plus, SON plus one, SON, and this compact. So what does it tell you? Well, it's really a non-trivial question when does these residues actually exist. And so Langner Shahidi theory will tell you that, well, if this period is non-zero, this residue must be non-zero. And Langner Shahidi theory tells you that this condition for this residue to be non-zero implies non-vanishing of a central value of standard function of SO2 n plus one. Um, so sort of this why I wanted to point out that somehow these numerics all tend to give you the, the very right term here. Um, so this sort of meta dates back to the work of Jan Gings, Borealis, and Sudri. Um, but the examples we, we, we were working on now uh, were really inspired by conjectures of Sakularidis and Venkatesh and explicit computations of dual groups of spherical varieties by <coughs> Knopp and Schalke. Um, okay, um, so there is actually two more. Um, so if you take simply connected um, E7 and uh, an involution whose fixed point is of type um, D6 times A1, um, you can take a parabolic with a Levy subgroup of type E6, it's self-associate, and an automorphic generic representation of E6. Um, then this intersection so what, what will appear is the, the period over intersection with the Orlevi with the subgroup. And it's again a symmetric subgroup of E6, of type A5, A1. Um, another example would be to start with S of 2n plus 2 and a symmetric subgroup S of n plus 3 and n minus 1. For a parabolic subgroup, take S of 2n times GL1, so Levy of this type, and automorphic generic representation. Then their intersection is S O n plus one, n minus one. It's a symmetric subgroup of S O two n plus two n. So the point is that this pair does not satisfy the condition of Prasad's theorem, whereas this one does. So this one doesn't, and this one does. Um, and so we get in the same way. This time the residue appears at one that the, the period of a residue will be equal to the period of the section over this intersection. Um, and so the language Shaki theory will tell you that uh, the residue of this, so there's a standard representation of E6 of dimension 27, 
in this case is a standard representation, the residue must be non-zero. So these two cases actually should be, um, this condition should imply that the representations come as a functorial transfer here from uh, endoscopic, twisted endoscopic group F4, and here from SP. So this, not vanishing this period, this relation suggests that this period detects um, functoriality from F4 in this case and here, in, and in this case from SP2 and minus 2. Uh, that's it. All right, thank you. Yeah, I, we don't know. I don't know yet. It's problematic.